I just moved around the side here just to come and sit with these guys again. I know some elephants can look like the next elephant, but um, these two are the ones that just walked past us a few minutes ago. So mother and calf. Just see the difference in uh, vegetation from when I was here last. It's really nice. Coming up to Buffalo Sook Dam, folks, and to me, it's always like a little bit of a, a little bit of a surprise. It's like opening a present when you drive up to a water point. You just don't know what's going to be there. And I just pop around this next corner here. It's absolute glass at the moment. So it's beautiful light, beautiful reflection. We'll just pop our nose in here for a little bit. See what we see. There's a beautiful grey hair in there, silhouetted, standing on a hippo's back actually. <laughs> Have a look at that, that's quite beautiful to see. I'm just going to leave the car running because sometimes you turn the vehicle off too quickly. But look at that, that hippo standing right on, I'm sorry, the, the uh, heron standing right on the hippo's back. Talk about uh, a uh, relationship there, hey? That allows that, that heron to get out a little bit deeper into the deeper water by standing on the hippo's back and hunting from the hippo's back. You don't see that too often. Beautiful grey heron. Oh, that's so lovely to see. We have seen this grey heron here quite quite a lot and uh, look at that. <laughs> just submerging in the heron just standing. So that heron will use that beautiful snake-like neck to dart that, <clears throat> that really sharp beak into the water and uh, spear a fish. And we saw him get, catch quite a, quite a decent fish the other day here. Um, that hippo seems to be the only, the only hippo that's here. He's a bull. Um, he's been here for some time as well, but there were two other females here with him the other day. But what a beautiful heron. And picturesque. We've seen many a, uh, a sight around this water point, that's for sure. Scotty had that incredible encounter with the buffalo down here drinking and the crocodile. There is a crocodile in here. I'm just looking around to see if it's hauled out anywhere on the on the sand. But I can't quite see. I'm just scanning around the, uh, the banks here. Just going to have a quick look through my binoculars while you're looking at that beautiful bird to see if there is a croc out. But, um, I did have to remind myself the other day as I was walking around here, there's a croc in here. You cannot drop your guard, folks. Um, because when we were up here last, there wasn't. But I can't see him anywhere. But we can sit here just for a second and uh, have a little, a little chat uh, about this water point. Animals will utilize this at all different times of the day but it's quite a, um, an important one this Buffalo Shook Dam. Uh, a lot of transient sort of herds of elephant will come through, they'll stop here, <coughs> they'll come through, stop here, drink, move right over through around the rest of the reserve and uh, and carry on but it's quite an important one. We saw an amazing wild dog hunt here a while back last November, one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. Just on that, uh, that point where the hippo is right now, there was a wild dog hunting uh, an impala. So it was a pretty, pretty incredible experience to see that right where the camera is now. We've got a question from Jimlin in Oklahoma. Jimlin, welcome to Wild Safari Live again, and I uh, hope you're well. Um, hope everything's good in your part of the world. 
And your question about wild dogs, if two packs came around this waterhole, would they meet? Uh, um, sorry, would they fight uh, when they met? Um, the answer to that is pretty much yes. Uh, it depends on the, on the size of the packs. If it was like just two animals, uh, uh, a duo versus like 10 or 15, you'd probably find that the two of them, uh, the two would take off and try and escape because they'd have no, no chance of survival really if they did, um, did attack. Uh, or did go for a conf confrontation. So they would, uh, we've had that recently happen with the Investec uh, pack that we, we tracked a couple of days ago. Uh, so it was a quite a, it is quite a fearsome battle. You might have seen on yesterday morning, or uh, gosh, I can't even remember when it was. It was it yesterday morning or the morning before um, when uh, the hyena was being chased by the, the wild dog. You can see the speed of those wild dog. They get up to fantastic speeds, you know, and they can they can withstand that. They can keep up that speed for quite a long bit, period of time. So um, it's highly. I mean, a wild dog can probably outrun a wild dog or just keep ahead of it. But the hyena, uh, they really struggle with that speed. That's just great. That, uh, but thank you for your question. And uh, the answer to it is that would two wild dog packs, uh, if they came into confrontation, would they f or came into contact, would they fight? The answer is potentially yes, uh, depending on the numbers, but uh, more than likely yes. And there can be easily a fatality. Okay, I'm going to take a, <coughs> a drive up here, and the next fork in the road, my friends. The first one to tweet left or right. The first next tweet that we get left or right is the one that I'm going to take. So tweet away, folks. Here we are. What's the first tweet? Left or right? There's our left road. There's our right road. Who have we got? You're crafting this drive. You're basically working with me. Uh, I'm going to just figure out what we're going to do. waiting just looking around whilst I'm waiting and I think we've got an email that's come through and the first person on email I'm just wondering who that was Elizabeth says go right. Elizabeth, you got it on email, matey. Thank you so much. Today is all about just free flow. The guys are over there. I talked to Aubrey. Uh, he didn't say there was a much around. He's gone on to another reserve. Pete's looking for leopard and following that up. We're just having a bit of a drive around through these less trodden paths. And Elizabeth, first person on email, thank you so much. Let's have a little look, see what we can find. Okay, folks, I've just stopped here just because we've got a vehicle up ahead, so we're just going to pass them nicely. We've got some elephant over here. And they're 
Murphy. How are you? All right, mate. You okay? Good, thank you. Good, you're not bad this afternoon? Nah. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, that is good because it looks look like a zoo. Yeah. We see lots of leopard. You got it, mate. Yeah, it looks like a zoo. Nice fun. I think cheetah for next time for the guests to come back next time to see cheetah. They'll be good. Now you're driving around now. Nothing can you do. Today is a Sunday, everything's in the church. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow everything's with a hangover. <laughs> it's not Monday. <laughs> So I just had a little chat with uh, Ephraim, uh, one of the other guides, but folks, I just want to tell you, Elizabeth, on email, you are fantastic. It's okay, darling, it's okay, it's okay, no problem, no problem, no problem. We wouldn't do that to you. If she wants me to move, I'll move my boat, that's okay. We can just sit here and watch you. So she just gave me a little signal. She just came towards us with open ears and just sort of said, I don't really want you to pass that road, but if you just keep your distance, you can have a little look at us. It's okay, my babe, don't mind. It's all right, it's okay, my darling. It's all right. Just moving away from her. She's given us a great, great signal there. So she says she wanted to pass across there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and show you that. That was a really, really good thing that she did and she's just showing us. I'm going to turn around so you can see her. She's a female that's got uh, a very young calf with her. And we'll just have a look at them from here. Really important to read those signs and signals. She gave us a little message and I took that and I totally respect it always. We'll stay our distance. She wanted to cross the road and she had her ears flared out a little bit just to tell me to move back so that's exactly what we did and we just watched her pass and that's a really really nice thing to do it's the it's reading the language the body language and the behavior of the animal she's got a youngster there with her and another youngster a bit more a little bit older probably another two or three years old maybe five years older really nice Elizabeth, how good are you? That is fantastic. So if we would have gone left, we might have seen something else, but we went right and Elizabeth crafted that little move for us and we came up and found three elephant, a beautiful youngster. This is elephantastic Sunday, that's for sure. Um, just feeding through this, this little bit of woodland here. It's nice and get, it's getting nice and cool. They may move down to the dam. They're quite close to the dam. So what I've let her do now is get back to her feeding, and I'm going to just move, turn my vehicle around so I can move up past her. And if she gives me any signal that if she turns around and stops and puts her ears anywhere near that sort of uh, sort of behaviour. I'll know that it's completely uh, completely not what she wants us to be around, but I think she's fine. I'm just getting a bit of a, a feeling that she's fine. I'm really glad you saw that because it was a great, uh, a great indication how you, you can read the elephant's behavior and you can listen to them. So her baby is quite close to me, so I'll wait for her baby to catch up to her and then not scare the baby, so he's fine. And you have a look up there. How's that shot for you, mate? Oops. I know they're a long way off, but she just wanted us to move on a little bit. And that's how we work together in the bush. We listen, we look, we learn. and they just move off together. They could be part of a, a herd that's spread out or scattered across this area, which we'll probably find out when we go around the next corner. Um, and I just want to make sure that she has passed and not come back around the same way that she's going in a straight line. Is she? Yep. So she's 
she's going in a straight line, so she's fine. And we can carry on our road with Christine's, Christine's road, there they are, over off in the distance there. Beautiful little youngster. So there you have it folks, that's a little, nice little bit of human animal interaction. She gave me a really nice uh, display, ears out. She's like, I want to come across the road, you're in my way, can you back off? I backed away, I got myself into a safer position. I didn't stand there or wait for her to pass around me. Um, she wasn't feeding and walking, she had her ears out, which is a, the sort of first sign of, you know, this is just a little bit too, uh, you're in my way and we read that and we moved and it's great sorry I just had a fly fly in my eye then really nice Christine's Road driven up here for a while, the M that's for sure. It's big sunset happening right there. And Ray in Scotland. Hello Ray, great to have you on board and welcome to Wild Safari Live. Look at that, that's pretty nice. That's a little bit better than looking into uh, the broken branch. Um, Ray, your question is what do elephants do at night? Well, elephants at night will be active, very active. Uh, they like to move around in the cool of the night. They can move vast distances during the night. They'll feed, they'll, they'll browse, they'll, they'll graze, uh, they'll relax, they even might lie down if the herd's big enough. Um, and they might do some dust bathing, they might get some bark off some trees and pick dig up some roots, go to a water point, have a drink, loads and loads of different things during the night and then uh, find themselves in the cooler parts of the morning doing the similar sort of thing and then uh, what they would do then is uh, get into those cool little valleys or the cool little areas that they are we found them in just now on Christine's Road. That road actually is called uh, Hippo Pools Road but I'm going to call it Christine's Road for this afternoon because uh, she chose it for us to find those Ellies. Now the first person to tweet in now uh, to give us a direction to go left or right would be fantastic. Uh, left or right either email at questions at Safari Live uh, questions at wildearth.tv sorry um, or you can tweet us at hashtag safari live the first person to get in is going to tell me whether I'm going left or right and that's going to take us on to our next little adventure we're out to get lost today we're out we don't really have a, a plan other than to go down these little less trodden paths I'm just looking over to see those elephants weren't coming down behind me there as I'm rabbiting on I just heard a little broken branch behind us there it's all good uh, and I'm waiting for the first person to tell me left or right so left it is or right it is what a sunset what a beautiful place you guys have been fantastic today absolutely sensational interaction great questions great fun um, and just really really nice to be doing a little bit different uh, getting out there with the, the app and the map and the going down some of these old haunts of ours and seeing what we could find we've still got a good amount of time to go um, so there's no worries there uh, and we're gonna it's the afternoon shadows are just gone now that little sun sunset is coming back And that first question, or the first person to tell me left or right, I will go left or right for you. Gosh, it's so beautiful and quiet here. I've got to give you my sensory update. My sensory update. Absolutely fantastic. 
Hey, Justin, you're a great man. Justin says, go right into the sunset. I'm with you all the way, my friend. What a great one, Justin. Great call, buddy. done now is just come down this road we've been getting tweets and emails on which direction to go today I'm not following any tracks or listening to the radio too much on uh, on the, the guides channel just because I thought we'd have a bit of fun and we just drive and see what we came across and you can craft it you can actually create the safari with me uh, for VM and I VM and I have done this before uh, Justin just uh, tweeted into us from I think it was North Carolina. I think I've got that right, I hope. But Justin was the person's name. And Justin, thank you so much. He said, go right into the sunset. And that's exactly what we've done. So we're going to just travel down this little, I haven't been down this road for a long time. I've got to, you can't even remember what it was called. Let's just have a little look here on our, on our little app. So we'll find out what it is. We are on uh, Gwauri Pan Road. There we go. So that's our little flashing little beacon there. I'll give him a flash for you. There we go. You can see him. So we've just turned off Hippo Pools Road, which was Christine Road for this afternoon. And then we're going down Gwauri Pan Road. So we're going to go around here and uh, probably head down Nyala Road North. Brilliant stuff, guys. Excellent. Really nice time of the day, cool, nice cat time. You never know what's around that next corner. Oh, so my sensory uh, update for you. Gonna give you a quick sensory update, and that is that the temperatures dropped dramatically. Uh, it's probably gone down into the 20s, early 20s now. It feels nice and cool. Um, they've got beautiful sense of that grassy smell again that is emitted in the a, in a moister times when the air gets moisture back. Uh, it just feels fantastic. It's quiet as a mouse here and it's just beautiful to be here, hey V? Yeah, it's really nice, really nice. So folks, I just want to give you another little update on uh, this fireside chat. We're not going to do the fireside chat tonight because we've got uh, an incredible amount of uh, technology to get to organized for the coming coming week and we're going to do instead we've decided to do two fireside chats for saturday and sunday nights consecutively two consecutive fireside chats both nights so hopefully you can pass that information around you can uh, put it on twitter or facebook if anyone asks the question share it around for us we'll put it up a couple of times as well we'll say it um probably a couple more times through the the, the safari tonight. Uh, oh, now. Oh, come on. Stay still for me. Stay still. Oh, come on. This is a little antelope I really want to show you. Come on, little diker. Please stay still. It's so tight in there. It's so hard. Beat. Tell me if you can see him. Where is it? I'll move forward for you. There's a tiny little antelope in there, folks. You might get a glimpse of him. And see his tail moving. Oh yeah, just, uh, I can't see his tail moving. Tell me when to stop. Uh, negative, I don't have a visual. Ah, oh, we've lost him. Tiny little antelope in there called a grey diker and it is a beautiful little antelope. They're so elusive, they just dive in. Dive in. <coughs> It's those fine little details. You see that flit in the... Sometimes there's two, uh, normally two actually, a pair. They've got this bizarre... They've got a bizarre ability to... Uh, 
I think I should show you a picture of one actually. That's probably the best thing uh, because I don't know if we're going to see that uh, antelope. So let me just try and get a picture of the diker up whilst I'm, I'm here. Whilst I'm talking, they've got a bizarre ability to, um, or a bizarre behaviour I should say, where they they have a vocalisation or an alarm call that they, when they get hurt or they get injured, uh, or they get they get stuck or they might have been attacked or something, they let out this incredibly unusual nasal alarm call. Now, um, when they let that out, it attracts other diker to the area to try and help it. It's a really, really bizarre thing that happens. It's one of the only antelope that I know that does it. Um, and let's see if I can find it. Here we go. There we go, there's a picture of it just there. Really pretty little antelope. Okay, and the reason I'm showing you this, I wouldn't normally show you pictures of the antelope because um, we, we see them, but um, beautiful little specialist antelope, as it says here, fruit specialist, eats occasional flowers as well as ants and small insects, and often known to eat birds as well. So um, a really unusual antelope and pretty little thing too. And this is an adult female without the horns. So this little uh, antelope does let out this bizarre uh, alarm call. Now I've been on a, a series called Hunters of the Lost World as I said before with the San Bushman and I also did another episode uh, up in Cameroon with, uh, with the Bucca Pygmies and um, some of those, those hunters will use, I mean these are people that live off the land, these are people that live uh, the, the forest and then is, is their life. Just looking through here for another one to see if we could see it. And I'm sorry, I went just looking through that area right then as I uh, finished that sentence. But um, those those hunters, uh, remembering subsistence hunters that live off the land that uh, have been there for many many moons, and uh, that that forest is their forest. That's their form of livelihood. It's not a supermarket that they can just walk down to. Um, they would use that call to attract diker to uh, to try and hunt them. So it's an extraordinary thing that human beings have adapted this this bizarre behaviour. I'm uh, oh, sorry, uh, this bizarre behaviour from the antelope. Human beings have adapted to utilise uh, sometimes in some different tribes around uh, around Africa. It's <laughs> if my <clears throat> I'll try and do it for you one day if I can. I'll try and do it now. <clears throat> it's a little bit like this. That sounds a bit bad actually, but I used to be able to do it a bit better than that. And what it is, is the same sound as the diker would make, and they would make that noise. Mine sounded a bit more like a trumpet or hornbill actually, but um, they would make this very, very sort of nasally sound. And there were some men that were better at it than others. And sure enough, those dikers had come running, or yeah, walking up, still unbeknown. So, I'm going to just take a little uh, left-hander here, folks, and see where that brings us out. Nice little, really nice one. Okay, so what we're going to do whilst I'm doing this, we're going to cross over to Pete, see what he's up to. I'm sure he's got something interesting, and uh, we'll come back if I find something just now. Silence or just a minute before ad break? <laughs> well, 
We said it earlier in the beginning of the drive. There's going to be a surprise. There always is. We would have been happy with just those elephants earlier. It was magic. And then, uh, and then this came up. I have to give a big shout out of thanks to Stefan and Scott. They've been out tracking as well earlier, looking around, and they found this cat for us. Just, just got here just before he joined us, a few seconds before, and we were lucky to get his head up. But just from the eye shape alone, this looks kind of like uh, Kunyuma to me. Again, those of you that know these leopards intimately, help me with uh, confirmation there, please, just to confirm it. We had a beautiful facial view there. I didn't have a look at the details, but uh, this leopard has got a very specific um, shape to his eyes, and he looks a lot like his father. The first time I saw Kunyuma, I knew that he was Mvula's, Mvula's boy. Oh, super, super awesome. This is also a characteristic that I'm now getting to know about Kunyuma. In fact, one of my probably three or four favorite leopard photographs ever is of this guy doing exactly what he's doing now he seems to like lying on his back and looking at the world upside down it's not something i've seen much with many or any other leopards really look at that guy he's like who is that my foot definitely kunyuma look at those eyes as i said earlier if someone can just give me a positive confirmation one or more of our friends that come and drive often and this leopard is just happy to be alive, happy that the evening is coming. And quite happy with us as well. He's a strange cat. I'm going to just go a little bit closer. Get us in on the side there. If you've maybe just joined us and missed how we found this cat, we got you literally a minute or two ago. Well, a minute and probably about 50 seconds by now, roughly. Um, Scott and Stefan were out tracking and they found him for us. So awesome stuff I believe this guy has got special tolerance for these vehicles for the, the vehicles that we're in oh my favorite leopard can hear those elephants from earlier in the distance still trumpeting and making sounds and making noise Is he hunting? Do you see that? He caught a fly. This, this cat just somehow seems a little bit more sort of dreamy, you know, like he like he has a bit of imagination. You know, like it's like sometimes when he does that sort of little snarl at us or at the vehicles and but he's not bothered, he's not feeling threatened in any way. It's just like he's I almost want to say more interactive. A bit shyer sometimes, but playful, but coy sometimes. And then other times we're right next to him, he's lying on his back. So there's no doubt whatsoever that he's 100% relaxed with our presence. I mean, there's no concern there. I'll never forget, the first time we really spent time with this leopard, it was below Gauri Dam Wall. Quite a tricky place to get into, and it was in this thick um, sort of undergrowth brush. It was, uh, I remember, some potato bushes and sort of shrubbery, difficult to see him, but eventually he was lying on his back just looking at us through the leaves and I remember that conversation as well, we spoke about a few things, but one of the things we discussed was that we in a way are habituating him to us specifically. This vehicle is slightly different from the other game drive vehicles, but shorter, but smaller, different shape, just myself and Brian sitting on the back, the antenna just looks a bit different, enough that they would recognize this as something specific. And ever since then I've felt that he's got a bit more tolerance 
even curiosity about about the wild earth vehicles. So just a big thank you. It's always so nice to have many other experts and many other more importantly enthusiasts on the vehicle. Getting lots of emails and Twitter responses there just confirming it is Kunyuma. Thank you very much. That is one of the many beauties and many joys of what we're doing here together. Is that we can share things not just over five and ten minutes, not just over a three hour game drive, but in the case of many of you over years, shared experiences, shared memories. <laughs> See the flies get to even the most regal of us. I want to go a little bit forward. I want to try and give you a, a view down at him. He seems totally relaxed with us. I don't think he's going to mind. I'm going to give you that sort of down the barrel view of him if it makes sense. Those eyes, uh, when they look right into you. Oh, a beautiful thing. I wonder what he's thinking. And he's not just lying there, he's not just doing nothing, he's not just being a vacant animal. He's looking at us. I often wonder what they're thinking, especially something like a leopard, you know, they just they live in a world that is so different from ours in terms of everything, in terms of their senses, what they can hear and see and smell and perceive. Their physical ability, I mean, what a leopard can do physically is something we can't even imagine in terms of their speed. Not just in what they can physically move at speed, but also what they can perceive. In other words, what they can do in response to an action. So, it must be an amazing thing being a leopard. Maybe that's what he's thinking. What are those humans doing? I wonder if it's amazing to be a human.
a very beautiful face. There's something, I don't really know how to describe it. Um, it's almost, I almost want to say like, you know, he's got a, He's got a gene that kicks back from somewhere, that a leopard that came from somewhere else. <laughs> That's probably an explanation that makes no sense, but there's something almost exotic about his features. And there's just something about Kunyuma, this guy, that not every single time I've seen him, because I mean, sometimes you, your response is emotional in the sense that you remember something from before. So not every time I've seen him because sometimes it's been quite quick, a glimpse here or a glimpse there. But every time that I've seen him where we spent a bit of time with him, where we actually sat with him, especially when it's been around this time, late afternoon, early evening, you know, when the bush goes quiet. And I talk about this often. And those of you that know me well, you know that I love this time. With this leopard, I sort of get the sense that he's got a similar sensitivity, I guess, to to some things. Guys, I'm just realizing now that where we're sitting, we've got very difficult radio comms. And... Uh, I think the only way we can do this is if I get two clicks from control and I will stay with this leopard as we are. If not, I can move a bit and get better radio comms, but we're in such a perfect spot now. Let's see if I get one click. What did I say now? now I'm confusing myself. <laughs> two clicks we're going to stay here and one click we're moving. So to confirm we've got two clicks. But guys, if you are asking a question, you're trying to have a conversation, I'm not answering it's because I can't hear you at the moment. So I just want to make sure I've got this right. Two clicks I'm staying, one click I'm going. You can just confirm for me, please. Awesome. Guys, now this is going back to the very early days of communication. We've got a confirmation that we're going to stay here for now. As I said, keep in mind we don't have good radio comms. I think it's because we're almost in this riverbed in front of us. We've got some big trees around us in front here. This area by now. Normally around about two years of age. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the female and the dominant male of the area will start putting some pressure on young males to leave, to become nomadic, to leave the area because uh, the big male doesn't want them around and having to challenge them later on. And um, also as they become sexually mature, then you don't want them really around the same area as their mother and potentially as their, as their uh, half-sisters or cousins as well because leopard females do sort of stick around, not always, but I mean we've got Karula here in the same area of what used to be her mother's safari's area. They used to coexist next to each other in two bordering territories. We've got um, the leopard we saw this morning with a cub, Shadow, that's Karula's daughter from some years ago. We've got Tandi, the other daughter, that uh, that is also still here. She's got a territory more towards the east. Oh, awesome. Let me get a bit of light on there. And uh, on that same train of thought, sorry, I'm just, Brian's just asking for a little bit of light here. Can make the plan there quickly. Sorry, <laughs> trying to move in a way not to bother the leopard. Not that he's bothered. You can see the eyes are just opened a little bit. There we go. Oh, that's lovely. Um, so let me just get back on that. So basically the young males, you don't want them sticking around because there's a good chance that not only is their mother in the same area, but also other related offspring, half-sisters from one or two litters before, cousins and so forth. So um, they get that pressure from both mum and the father to, to leave the area. But that's not something that happens in the morning. She doesn't get up one day and say, listen guys, that's it, pack your bags, off you go. It's a gradual process. And it seems that Karula has a tendency to allow the males to stick around just a little bit longer. 
and uh, Mvula, the father of these guys, have also been seen to interact with them to some extent. So there's a definite allowance, if you want, by both Karula, who is the dominant female in the area. They stay physically in her area. And then Mvula, the male, which he's got a much, much larger territory. But within that area, this is one of the areas that falls under him. And he's also tolerating it still. I don't think it'll be much longer. I think we are in the last days and last weeks of being so spoiled with these two young males. Um, but yeah, what a privilege. I mean, we've seen in the last 24 hours, really, 48 hours, we've seen three different leopards all related to each other in some way. Four, if you count the cub. Just quickly, quickly, let's play a game here. It's not a game, but imagine along with me. And this goes especially for those of you that have been on a few drives already. Just close your eyes for a second. And don't feel weird, don't worry. Lots of us are doing it. I'll, I'll do it as well. My eyes are also closed. Just close your eyes for a second. And there's not a lot of sounds around us, but it's nice and quiet and it's peaceful. There's a couple of birds calling. And before you open your eyes, don't open them yet. Before you open your eyes, just imagine you've never seen a leopard before. Never. Not in your life. And when you open your eyes just now, you're going to have that opportunity. And I want you to just look at this animal again. Just reappreciate the beauty of it because it's such a beautiful animal. So on three, you're going to open your eyes. And before you do so, imagine you've never seen a leopard before. So what you're going to see now is something you're seeing for the first time ever. One, two, three. And just look at the patterns, I just look at the colors. Beautiful, soft, sort of almost snow white chest with the spots and the rosettes on it. You can see that line sort of on the front of the chest just before the neck. Especially male leopards, they get these collars that uh, becomes um, become more prominent when they get older. Look at the markings on the head. Beautiful line of spots coming down from the ear down towards the eyes. Soft nose, very, very soft nose, as you've all touched, or many of you have touched the nose of a cat. It's like that, just many, many times bigger. And in many parts of the world, leopards are now the creatures of myth almost. People don't see them anymore. So to sit like this and enjoy it like this and appreciate like this is something that we must cherish. We must not take it for granted ever. It's still unbelievable for me sometimes. And it's not to go on about it, but I'm just having like a really sort of uh, awareness of it tonight. And I've done this a lot. I've been fortunate in my life to have spent many hours in the bush, many, many hours. And many of those I've been fortunate enough to have spent with leopard. But still I sit here now and I have to pinch myself because it just feels a bit surreal that we can have this elusive shy cat that in many parts of the world you don't see anymore either because they're gone or because they've learned the only way to survive is to absolutely avoid humans. Yet here we can sit and see the evening star in the distance. In fact, I can see two beautiful stars at the moment, not really stars, actually planets. You can see both. It looks like Saturn and Venus. And right next to us here is a leopard just taking a nap unperturbed by us, unconcerned, just about aware.
I think he's dreaming. Mm. Yep, he's dreaming. And that just shows you how comfortable he is with us. Sleeping, not only sleeping next to us, but sleeping deep enough that he's actually dreaming there. I'm going to take a guess here, and, and, and we'll do this in the name of rehearsal, because keep in mind, you're joining us for a live rehearsal. Um, like everything in life is, I guess it's all a rehearsal for the next event, but uh, we don't have radio comms. I can't hear the control room, and uh, we've got eight minutes left for the drive. So I know Hayden wants to say goodnight to you. He's had a good exploring afternoon with you. So we're going to go to him shortly just to say goodbye, and... Uh, I'm going to reverse a little bit and maybe get some radio comms after that just to get the plan. And then we're going to look at this leopard and say goodnight from here. I think that will work. This is me sort of teetering out on a limb there. But I think let's go to Hayden. He wants to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us. And I will see you back on the vehicle shortly to say goodnight from the leopard. Folks, we've just, um, William and I took a little uh, detour, and uh, <laughs> that was about, hmm, probably about 15 minutes ago. Um, we're not quite out of it yet, but I think that's the main road up there. Um, I haven't seen a road for about the last 20 minutes, so, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, we just had a question uh, about leopard territories, and... Um, I just, uh, I have actually forgotten who the name of the, who the question was by because we were stuck uh, in this in this area. So I'm going to just just let me get out of this area first, and hopefully my vehicle starts. Mm. <laughs> this is, is it talk about getting lost. This is what we wanted to do. We're not lost, but I'm just going to let the the Wendy uh, have a little bit of a breather here. Um, the question was about leopard territories, and the question was, do uh, leopard territories, the females and the males territories, overlap? Um, well, the definitive answer is not a definitive answer, really. Uh, it's such a sort of... Uh, there is a difference between territories and home ranges. A territory is something that they will sort of protect more exclusively, but they still overlap slight slightly. A home range is an area that they will traverse. Um, it, it's, it's very quite, quite complex, but um, there's no sort of exclusive uh, area. When a female's breeding, there'll be an exclusive area that she protects or she stays in. Uh, but generally speaking, males will traverse. We've seen a classic example of Kanuma. Her territory is sort of up around uh, Quarantine and, and uh, all around Juma Lodge and around up in Sandy Patch. Uh, quarantine her son goes right across her territory and back and then we had um, shadow her daughter over in her territory this morning a little bit so there's a little bit of a crossover it's all very loose um, but at the same time there's scent marking and different uh, ways that they will uh, they will make sure that each of them understand that information as well so I hope that answered your question um, And I think I'm going to try and start the vehicle, um, but <laughs> we might say farewell before I do that, so don't waste time starting the vehicle, just in case it doesn't start. 
Um, I definitely got fuel, everything's fine, but I just want to round off by saying thank you to everyone today. Ours was a bit of a drive around to get to know different roads that we haven't been now for a while. We saw some alleys, some Nyala, talked about some tracks and things like that, which was really good fun. And you directed the drive as well. You told us to go left and right. Elizabeth, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate the, seeing those leopard, I'm sorry, those Ellies. And uh, Justin, the go to the right, we went right into the sunset, which was fantastic. So really, really nice, nice one. Um, Pete's had an extraordinary day with elephants and mixed together, that's what Wild Safari is all about. That's what having two vehicles is all about. Um, and Pete's leopard to finish is just fantastic. So really beautiful, great to have you here. If you want to ask us any questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, uh, questions at wildearth.tv for email. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. And I'm really looking forward to uh, waking up tomorrow and doing exactly the same thing all over again. We are not going to have a fireside chat tonight, folks. We're going to do it two consecutive nights next weekend. We've got loads of tech to sort out. I'm sure you understand, but Saturday and Sunday night next week is going to be what we do. Um, really looking forward to it. VM, have you had a good afternoon, mate? Great. Thanks, mate. It's good to be back in the saddle with you. That's for sure. We're going to go back to Peter and uh, see what he's up to, and I'm going to say farewell. Thank you very, very much, guys. Look forward to seeing you again. Signing off. Thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye now. See if this starts. Hey, the Wendy. Well, in a way, I sort of feel like there's not that much left to say for today. It's been one of those afternoons where... The casual comment of there will be a surprise paid off in bigger ways than I could have hoped for. Just uh, the elephant earlier, fantastic interaction with that youngster, and then having this beautiful leopard, not only because he's my favorite leopard, any leopard would have been amazing like this, but this Pacific cat I've got a bit of a soft spot for. Temperature is perfect. Got a forktail drongo singing in the background. Full moon rising behind us, it's full moon tomorrow night, so almost virtually full moon behind. And it is just absolutely beautiful. And what can you say? I mean, it's, it's, there's not really much you can just say in mere words. Maybe if I was Shakespeare, you know, I could, I could put this into context. But it's been a fantastic afternoon. And um, just on, the, on that line, it is Sunday. We're not going to have a fireside chat tonight because we are sort of amping up towards two fireside chats next weekend, the 9th and the 10th for the drives to TV as well, as well as on the, the Wild Earth sites. So uh, we'll do the fireside chat thing. But for now, guys, just thank you so much. Thank you so much for making it possible for me to be here and for all of you to be here. It's been a special afternoon. It's what this is about. The experience of being in the bush live, the surprises, the elations, the emotions, the joys, the happiness. Brian as well. Yeah. We had a fantastic afternoon. Great elephant, great leopard, HD. Lacquer afternoon knowing you're out there as well. And um, I'm going to say good night. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning live again on Safari. Bye-bye.